to the Bear Wozniak Adventure. Kickstart that engine and roll thunder with the pack. Explore the grittiness of masculine spirituality. Gain traction in the virtues. And soup up your spiritual engine by turning adversity into adventure. Now, here's Bear Wozniak. Let's ride. Aloha and welcome to the Bear Wozniak Adventure. I'm your adventure guide, Bear Wozniak. I'm coming to you today from beautiful Waikiki Beach. I'm looking outside and there's no surf today. So I figured I had nothing better to do, so I'd record a radio show uh, with our great guest we have today. I'll let you know who he is in a little bit. But I should let you know, I'm my, my condo in Waikiki is right on the beach, right ne next to St. Augustine's Church. And right below me right now, there's construction going on uh, with the... Um, building of the St. Damien and St. Marianne Museum. So it's right next door. In fact, when I look up my window, if I lean out, I'm right over the altar. So what a privilege to be here in Waikiki Beach. But, you know, I had this kind of longing for, uh, for um, the cold, blustery areas. You know, sometimes when you're in Waikiki suffering for Jesus with these palm trees blowing and the perfect sunshine, it's, it's, it, 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 you know, you long for chances to be in the cold, in the blizzards in the of the northwest and uh i began to think about my beautiful time i had a cabin in montana up by glacier park uh pole bridge montana four miles from the canadian border um in right in, on the north fork of the flathead river uh and i thought i should find a guest who's who's somewhere in nor uh, somewhere in northwest montana but i remember uh uh hunting in montana and uh, I went out with uh, my father and a couple of men, and our job was my dad was going to sit in one area of this of this uh, this mountainous area, and the rest of us were going to kind of walk uh, through this through these two valleys and move try to move some deer towards each other, and eventually up to where my dad was. And uh, I was I, you know I had my compass, and I go okay, go, I'm going to check out my compass because it's started to snow a little bit. The snow's about a foot deep, and also. It's cloudy, so you lose your perspective. You don't see the mountaintops, so you kind of really lose your perspective. And I began to walk, and um, after a while, I realized I should be where I, I should be there by now. And I began to be a little bit concerned, but I just didn't trust my compass. It seemed like my compass wasn't working. And then I came across some fresh tracks with some pretty deep, some you know, real fresh, like someone had just walked in that area within the last few hours. I thought, I'll follow this guy's tracks. He seems to know where he's going. And I followed those tracks until I came around full circle again and came to the same intersection. So I realized I was going in circles because I wasn't using my compass. And, uh, man, I mean, that, that sounds like it's kind of humorous, but I was in a situation where I could be, you know, the, the, night, the, the night comes early in Montana that time of year, and I could have been in real serious condition real fast because of the, 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 the snow kept coming and, and uh, there's grizzlies around and... Uh, and so I've learned the value of having a compass. Uh, and that's why we, we as Catholics are so fortunate because we have the teaching of the Catholic Church. We have the great Thomistic tradition within our church. We have the intellectual uh, element of our church, the philosophical element of our church, the, the doctrinal element of our church, and the spirituality of our church. And, uh, and so why not go big and why not go deep, as we say here in Hawaii? So I was thinking about those wonderful times walking through the deep snow of Montana. So I thought, why not bring on Dr. Greg uh, DeSaver uh, from uh, the Imago Dei Center uh, in Montana. So, Doc, welcome to our show. Praise be Jesus Christ, Bear. Have Good you ever had a, Have you ever had an experience like that, walking in circles? Walking in circles. Ah. Uh, <laughs> No, but I, 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 more so, I usually just kind of go and fall off a cliff, um, you know, yeah. And so, uh, and then I end up wherever God intends. So, I mean, you, you, in Montana, you've, you, you hunt with your sons, right? You said you've hunted. We hunt, uh, yes, hunting. Um, uh, but uh, most of that, I mean, the, the falling off the cliffs, I was, I was thinking back more in my Marine Corps infantry days. Oh, actually. yeah, so you weren't just kidding. Yeah. So that's no, happens. Course, yeah, well, and of course, of course, uh, as well with our with our faith, right? Because yeah. a lot of times we crash and burn, and then our, our Lord we take another leap of faith, right? And and yeah. He leads us through those uh, misadventures. Well, what were you what were you referring to in your Marine Corps training? Well, I was, I was in the Marine Corps twice, actually. So uh, um, now the first time you, you didn't the work Corps, the first time. Is that what happened? 
Well, you know, yeah, I mean, first time, you know, right, youthful exuberance, uh, you know, foolishness, it's understandable, right? The second time, well, that's kind of maybe a little bit pathological. You got to wonder if some guy's a little bit not right in the head. So anyway, but, uh, you know, no, the Marine Corps was, was, uh, was, was good. However, interestingly enough, as we're talking about this compass, you know, for me, the Marine Corps is always about being a man, you know, being a warrior, faith and family, serving Christ. And in this day and age, especially, I think more and more, you know, you're, you're asked to sometimes to surrender those or to compromise those values for rank or for whatever else. And for me, as we say in the Marine Corps, that was a no-brainer. There was no way in the world I was going to do that. And again, what was my compass? Well, it was actually Christ crucified always. So no matter what, falling, battles, this and that, you, you keep your eye on Christ crucified, and that, that is our compass always and forever as Catholics. Well, so you have a, an interesting background. Can you explain, give us your academic background, first of all? You're, you're a clinical... Well, to give us instead of me explaining it, why don't you do that for us? Okay. I think we got to build a little foundation here so people really get yeah. who, who you are. Absolutely. So it's um well so I was I my my education goes all the way back to the St. Ignatius Institute and, and philosophy undergrad with and that was with Father Joseph Fessio at the University of San Francisco and great books program. Oh my god! Oh wow! I mean I'm I'm jealous. Yeah. No. It was it was a, what, it was what an education. Happened. Yes, and we call this the old. The, we call this the original St. Ignatius Institute because it's changed since those times. But we had some uh, really uh, in, incredible uh, um, teachers, and, and it, was, it was a wonderful experience. Um, and then after the, the Marine Corps, um, I, uh, I taught in the seminary, and I also was at the John Paul II Institute of Marriage and Family. So I got my master's degree in theology, so philosophy, theology, and the you know Marine Corps in between. And so that's a great. Then, that's a great regimen. I mean. That's awesome. You've got that, that intellectual side, then you're gonna, you get all physical. And all, yes. all, all of them are various disciplines, uh, yes. training your well, body, soul, and spirit. Absolutely. Well, see, that's one of the great occupational hazards of, of the academic is being an ivory tower intellectual. And um, as uh, one of my professors said, the effete elite. So mm -hmm. you don't tend to translate it into actual practice. <laughs> now, now, interestingly enough, psychology, as I went into clinical psychology, I was very inculcated in the Catholic worldview, deeply, and I, and I was, and, and stubbornly so, okay, I, was, I wasn't going to veer from, again, that cross, but clinical psychology does veer from that, in fact, much of it is aimed at escaping it, mm -hmm. whatever that may mean, you know, killing the pain, you know, it could be medication, or it can be just trying to allow one to cope, that is, put mm -hmm. blinders on, so, um, and I know you're very much uh, an advocate of, of, of taking the leap of faith and having courage and living life fully. And so clinical psychology, when I came to it, I already had a Thomistic perspective, a Catholic perspective. And so therefore, as I studied it, I saw the pitfalls, but I was also able to apply a remedy in something that would, would suffice. And that was what psychomoralytics is, psychomoralytics. And, um, is this a terminology that you've developed, or is, is that a Yes, a use psychomoralytics to distinguish it from psychology, which ah. the term psychology has actually been, it's a great term, right? It means study of the soul. But strangely enough, what's been happening is that the, the state has co-opted that term, and the mental health professions have co-opted that term, and they don't even believe in the soul. So in a sense, the state has stolen the soul. So we've yeah. you, this is a separate discipline. The state is, a church. It's state is the church. Yes, exactly right. And the mental health system is the more magisterium. It determines. Oh, exactly. The DSM yes. Is, yes. So, is, is so heretical now. Yes. It determines what it means to be human. Mm. And, you know, yet, and, it, says, and yet it excludes God. It's absolutely. And they, and they talk about freedom. They talk about human dignity. And they say, but yes, you choose to be whatever barnyard animal you want to be. Mm-hmm. And, and, and that's great for them because they can control you then. You're mm -hmm. just a, you have to just react to your egoistic and your hedonistic desires. And then you can be controlled and you can be enslaved. This is a whole system. Now, if you look at my, my website, you can see we go into this deeply. There's a new book out there, Psychomoralytics. And, you know, look it up, look my name up, you find it. But the point is, this is a remedy to that. This actually frees you and it instills you with the courage to live life fully and completely. The heights of joys and the depths of sorrows, but unafraid. And all at the foot of the cross. Yes, Because the whole the whole DSM is taking the cross out of the out of the picture. 
Absolutely. Whether it's pro-life uh, situation or transgender issues or whatever, Absolutely. it's just take the cross out. Um, and how can you be fully human if you're meant to be fueled by the power of the Holy Spirit to be fully alive? How can you be how can you be fully human without a a, a, a deep uh, relationship with the Lord at the cross? That's right. Now, and now, and, and also, bear look at now with psychomoralytics. This is really it addresses man on the natural level. But man on the natural level is also spiritual. It's not just physical. It's spiritual. Right. And, and so when we talk about the cross, and I don't have to talk about Christ crucified yet, but when we talk about the cross, we're talking about reality. We're mm. talking about saying yes to reality, which mm. means saying yes to the God of reality. And you accept it on the natural level. And as the church teaches, you can assent to the existence of God without any faith. It's a logical, necessary assent. If From you a philosophical point of view, well, even yes. Aristotle and yes. had to yes. accept that. We're going yes. to take a quick break here, Doc. Uh, we're talking with Dr. Greg DeSilver, De, De, De Saver, uh, from uh, coming to us from Montana, by the way, today. And I'm here in beautiful, warm Waikiki, but Montana, a place that I genuinely love. But, uh, Doc, what's, what's a great website where they can reach you? SoulDeepScience.com. Soul. Soul deepscience.com. This is the Bear Wozniak Adventure, but we'll be right back with more. Aloha and welcome back to the Bear Wozniak Adventure. I'm your adventure guide, Bear Wozniak. Today we have a co -ho our co-adventure guide is Dr. Greg Del Saver, um, you know, we're going to probably have a chance to see Greg here, hopefully, this coming August. Uh, you know, Long Ride Home, our EWTN motorcycle reality TV show, is going to be filming season four soon. We're going to go from Cocoa Beach, Florida, up to Michigan to meet with the Knights on Bikes. They're going to have a big rally, about a thousand uh, Catholic bikers going to show up. And then we're going to roll thunder west towards uh, Glacier Park and hope to be spending uh, a good four, five to six days, maybe even a week in the Glacier Park Rolling Thunder. So uh, Greg is in that same area of Montana. It's the same area where I built a cabin uh, with my family. I actually built this cabin thinking it would be a good sort of uh, physical thing to do. It wouldn't take any mental work at all. I I uh, was done with my CPA season, and I, I drove up there, and I got the raw materials. I was going to build a, a cabin. Maybe it's about 20 by 12 feet or something like that, the dimensions. And I had to – we had to – cut down trees. We had to level the foundation, the wood foundation. We built it on skids because I thought one day I might move that cabin. And we had to learn how to square that cabin, which is a big deal, leveling and squaring it. And then we had to build the trusses, build, put the roof on and, and get it done before the, before the snow that came August 10th of that year. Uh, so, um, so I know um, the importance of having something that's true of having a, uh, a, a, the, the level and having a, something that lets you know when something's true and straight. And that's why, as Catholics, we're so fortunate because we have the magistering of the church teaching us uh, the way that we should go. And we've got, to, got Dr. Greg DeSaver with us. He has a, you know, as, as Catholics, as Christians, we should always be kind of swimming upstream. He's bringing kind of uh, the psychology back to, uh, to mystic teaching back to reality, really, uh, that we need to deal with the whole man. And uh, Doc, uh, welcome back to the show. Thank you, Barry. Yeah. I want to ask you this question. Uh, what, do you what do you see as the current state of, uh, you know, speaking of uh, absolute values and absolute truth and uh, this whole challenge we have where it seems like the whole world's been turned upside down, what do we say to our men, especially our young men these days? What they're, yes. they're really facing... Uh, uh, massive confusion. Yes, yes. Well, um, you know the uh, the the American Psychological Association just came out with a study that was years in the making that said that conclusion was that traditional masculinity is unhealthful. Okay, this is the this is the mental health system. Tradition now. Now my first question was. Well, where do they ever see any traditional masculinity? <laughs> <Okay>. <laughs> it's sure not in the ranks of the APA. But anyway, uh, but be that as it may, this is what they do. They've been on the forefront 
of destroying the family and traditional morals in this country. And they are the moral magisterium of the state. So it has to be rejected, I would say wholesale. And if you, and if, again, if you look at the book, Psychomoralytic, the website, you see we are really going up against them head to head and say, no, this is wrong. And we need to have a true Thomistic understanding. Now, again, with that Thomistic understanding is you talked about reality. And we do need to introduce our young men to reality, which is, now, reality is the cross. It is. Mm-hmm. But guess in what? What allows us to enter deeper into reality? Only the true faith. Only the true faith. It doesn't get us away from it. It doesn't tell us we're saved and we're going to prosper. It doesn't tell us it's not an opiate. The true faith mm-hmm. leads us deeper into reality. And what do we find? Wow. We find Christ crucified. Wow. Praise God. That's, a, that's proof of the truth of our holy faith. So, but for our young men, yes. So here, here we are today. We're not accepting reality. Number one, we have these seven vocations we talk about uh, in psychomoralytics. But the first one is, is accepting reality as an image of God, a volitional, rational being. Accept reality, even though you don't like it always, right? Because it does. What does reality do? It does go contrary to us. God's ways, not our ways. But we say yes to that for love of God. And then we die to ourselves. No longer we live, but Christ lives within us. That's the maturation process. But, and that's, but secondly, we're incarnate beings. And yes, that means accepting our mortality, accepting our suffering, but it also means accepting our gender, <laughs> male and female. That's what God created them. And so to instill these virtues and these of, of, of just saying yes to your masculinity and yes to your femininity and, and celebrating God-given gender, which, by the way, Bear, another plug. With that, I, I wrote a book, Celebrating God-Given Gender. We have to go down to that level to, to, to instill that. So for the young men, they have to be very intentional. And when I say intentional, is this, is that a young man, you know, he may be discerning what he wants to be when he grows up. And what I tell him is this, I say, no, that's not a question. You already know what you're supposed to be, God's calling you to be. And that is a, a, a man that's seeking holiness, a man of faith and family, and, and those are your causes. And then... That's what you're already made to be. That's it. That's number one. The rest will follow. Whatever you want to be, you know, you want to, you know, those are secondary and God will let you know that. But you first, again, you seek first the kingdom of God. That's what you are. And so, and then it directs everything toward that. It's easy to know God's will. It's really easy to know God's will because God's will is for you to be in his image. Yes. uh, To develop, to grow in the seven virtues, you know, and, and to have this cause. That's greater than you. When I got my I got my first degree black belt, we had we had a motto, and it was from King David: "Lead me to the rock too high to climb, and I will climb it." You know, by the eye will crush a troop; by the eye will leap a wall; by the eye can bend a bow of bronze. We young men need a challenge that's bigger than they can take on, without having to grow to become that purpose, and without God's help. And when you abandon yourself to God's will, everything gets exciting. Because you, if you abandon yourself to God's will, he's going to challenge you to do things you can't do uh, with your own strength and can't do with the way you are at that time. He's going to cause you to uh, die to self, live a life of virtue, and become the goal, not accomplish the goal. And, that, and God's ultimate purpose is for us to be like him. Once you get that simple truth in place, everything else becomes more clear. It doesn't become easy. It can be hard, but it becomes more clear. What Absolutely. is the difference between c- coward and a courageous person and a coward and a coward? Yes, yes. And um, and by the way, we do talk about this magnanimity and cause, faith and family. And that is absolutely, you're exactly right, Bear. Now, how do you gain the courage to actually do what you have to do, what, do what God's calling you to do? And yes, it could be, yes, what's it mean? Well, it can mean your entire annihilation. I mean, it can, it will mean that we're giving our lives fully, completely to the Lord as a living holocaust. How do you gain the courage to do that? Well, again, it is what, who do you love more? What do you love more? Do you love yourself more or do you love God more? Do you love yourself more or do you love your cause more? Do you love yourself more or do you love your family more? When you have a greater love than your love of self, than egoistic love, then you gain the courage to lose yourself. And you're right. It's not even in the accomplishment. It's in living it out and loving in the process. Yes, you become that goal because what? Even if you lose, if mm-hmm. you will, in the, in the real world, according to the, the eyes of the world, you're victorious. 
you overcome evil. And, and you're, you're not talking about a. Uh, you know, I'm talking about a. Uh, oh, what's that trophy they call all the kids get when they just show up? Participation. <laughs> it's not a participation trophy that right. you're talking about. It's yeah. that you gave it all. That's right. right? And right. In, a, in, a, in a quest for something that's bigger than you. Yes. And for a purpose that's outside of you. Uh, what, what Thomas said love was is, is, is uh, willing the true good for the other. And as John Paul II said, self-donation. Yes, yes. So how do, how do you – go ahead. Well, I was going to say – and also, you know, and, and Mother Teresa, you know, a little old lady. I had a pleasure to meet. But, you know, she – as she said, it's not if you're successful. It's if you're faithful. Amen. Yeah. yeah. So praise God. Yeah, so the, our, our ultimate purpose is to be made in God's image. And you're at the Imag Imago Dei Center, I guess? And where yes. is that located? In Imago Dei, which is God's image. And again, yeah. we're up in here in Montana. We work all over the world through video conferencing. Mm -hmm. um, we work a lot with religious. We, we have a huge uh, work with um, within monasteries themselves to help even monks and nuns achieve this. So um, because, again, grace builds upon nature. But when the nature's not in place, then that grace doesn't find a soil that is actually fertile and able to nourish the seeds of the gospel. Perfect. We're talking with Dr. Greg DeSil DeSalver. I'm not saying it right, Dr. Greg DeSaver, but he's letting me call him Doc. He's coming to you from Montana. I want to remind, remind everybody to go to our website, deepadventure.com. Uh, our TV show, Long Ride Home, we're wrapping up season two right now. It should be up on a EWTN within a few months, but you can go to iTunes, to Amazon Prime Video, to Google Play, and watch all 10 episodes of season one. Um, we're, I think, the only the second show on EWTN to ever be uh, placed with the Armed Forces Network. We're also the only the second show on EWTN ever to be uh, put on, on iTunes and Prime Video and Google Play and things like that. And it's a great show for you, especially like thinking of homeschool parents. Have your kids watch all 10 episodes. If you're sitting around with a, a, a family friend or having a cigar one night or something like that, it, turn, turn it on and, and have a friend of yours watch it. It'll gr bring out great conversation. And we're hoping to uh, get to see Dr. Greg DeSaver De De uh, in Montana when we shoot season four this coming August. Greg, what's your website? It's uh, souldeepscience.com. Souldeepscience.com. We'll be right back with more of the Bear Wozniak Adventure. Aloha and welcome back to the Bear Wozniak Adventure. We're here with Dr. Greg Dilsaver. We're talking about what masculine uh, spirituality is. I don't even use the word masculine anymore. I just talk about manliness. Uh, but I have a question everyone in our audience is dying to hear. You know, people are, we have millions of people listening uh, on EWTN. It also goes out to every podcast, and it's also on YouTube. So if you guys go to the YouTube uh, channel, Bear Wozniak, you can uh, watch this uh, video with with. Doc Sil De Silva De Sil De Saver. and Doc. Everyone wants to know who's watching this on YouTube. What uh, what razor do you use on your finely groomed uh, beard? Is it a Gillette? <laughs> no. <laughs> I guess we're referring to this new this commercial that's come out lately, the Gillette commercial. What is what you know? They're talking about toxic masculinity. What is a true man? Compare the two. A true. A true man, well, masculinity, a true man, the deepest manhood is, again, based on love and, and about dying for a cause and giving your life for it. And most necessarily giving your, if you will, your pride and self-love. We die to ourselves. And what do we give ourselves to? For first, on the natural level, we give ourselves to the family, to our, to the women, these to this better half, to this, this, this sweet and good part of humanity. And I talk about femininity. See, we have to understand femininity as well. And we don't understand that in our culture. But as I talk about in, in the book, Celebrating God-Given Gender, femininity is a distillation of the masculine. So we know that from Genesis. Woman was taken from man. And we know that also from genetics, X is taken from XY. That Xness, the, I call it the X factor or the XX factor of femininity. And so that is a nectar, a distillation, the sweeter part. And there's a purity there in the creatureliness. 
And again, you know, this is how why our, the perfect creature had to be a woman. So men are. Are you referring to Mary now? Yes. So, yes, that's right. Okay. So that's why men need to cultivate a devotion to the feminine and not in the way the world values it. Not in, and really the world values it in masculine terms. It's either in the erotic value or it's in how well they can do a man's job. And that's missing the X factor. That's missing that which we should be devoted to. And that's what we see in our devotion to our Blessed Mother. It misses that. It's an intangible something, a receptivity, a sweetness that we have. Men need to cultivate the devotion so they can protect that. That's why women and children first, of course. This is one of the most beautiful statements I've ever heard, Doc. Can you say that one more time so it really sinks in? It's one of the most beautiful descriptions of femininity I've ever heard. So women, femininity, the woman, the feminine charism is what we call, you know, what I call the X factor, the XX factor. It is a distillation from that course in matrix, from the XY, a distillation that brings the creature to its perfection. And the creature in its perfection, in our perfection, is in receptivity, as we see personified in our Blessed Mother. And this receptivity, this femininity then, is a actual liqueur that derives from a course of matrix. And that's why as men, we have a devotion to it in that sweetness, in its clemency. And we, we then give our lives to protect that. That's the only reason the men should go out in the world and do battle, is to protect the feminine. And of course, so that's what we need to cultivate, a devotion to the feminine. And again, that is not anywhere. Unfortunately, not even in most circles of the church, we have so lost that in our today's day and age because we're so out of touch with natural law. And, and of course, we have this crisis of gender. So we need to celebrate God-given gender. We need to be intentional about it today's day and age. So, so it's so interesting how you define the woman in a sense uh the, the distillation of the of the of the of the, ma- the way the man is, and that the man really becomes manly in his relationship to that woman. You can almost like you need to see both of them side by side to really see them both clearly. A Absolutely. man alone is different than a man with a woman. You've written a book, um, I, Priest, Prophet, King. What is the what what is the definition yeah. of that book? Or the the, uh, the title? Do you remember? Trouble with the movie. Yeah. <laughs> ah, okay. So. This, yeah, so here, <laughs> so here we go. Um, shameless plug, but now that was the pre prophesying king was the one that was, um, and I was on the EW10 with that. I was on Women of Grace for that. Yeah, so, I know. Uh, that, yeah, that's beautiful. What is it? What's it called again? The, the three, the three marks. Three marks of manhood. And that's was that tangent? But who wrote that? Who published that? Yes, Tan. Yeah, uh-huh. I mean they're great, great, great books. The Three Marks of a Manhood, by yes. Dr. Greg Dilsaver. But the one that speaks more about specifically about femininity. Um, and which is, I love reading it because I writing it because I, I learned so much. Right. But, uh, it was this one, this was a celebrating God given gender. Mm-hmm. Very good. And that one, we talk about the feminine We talk about the psychological, physiological. And, and, uh, so that's, um, and so fun. So we also got two more, these are the psychomoralytic books, but this was the Catholic university and this is psychomoralytic's new book. This is the, this is the last one. So excellent. Anyway. So now, now having said that, what, what, did, what did the book, um, uh, uh, for for the men, uh, what in what way do you challenge them to to manliness? Well, n- number one, you know, it's it's a uh, I challenge them. I mean, we talk about patriarchy. Yeah, talk about talk that. About, I want to hear about yeah, that. Yeah, yeah. We talk about Christian patriarchy. We talk about leading your family and taking responsibility for your family. Now, you know, there, you know, as we know, we've heard so often, you know, this is the age of the laity, but. Why is it the age of laity? It's not so that the laity can act like priests. It's, it's, it means the age of laity, but it's the age of fatherhood and motherhood. And we know that because why? Because the family's under attack as never before. Mm. Gender's under attack as they move forward. So we know wherever there's an error or heresy, that's when the orthodoxy is defined. Mm. And so it's the age of the family and really the re- an entire right now, a reorientation, and, and the way it's supposed to be, even in the church itself, even in the hierarchy, because it's about the bishops and the priests ministering unto the faithful, 
properly so, and that's how it's always supposed to be. But sometimes in the past, and we can see some of the problems that's, that's occurred because of this, it, it tends to become all about the priests and the bishops, and, and it's inversed. It comes mm-hmm. top, top heavy. They're there to minister unto us, the faithful. Servant of the servants of God. Yeah. Yes, yes, they're ministers unto us. And so, so that means then that you're not going to look to your pastor or to your bishop or into the pope to lead your family. You, God's given you, you know, the charism to lead that family and have a vision to lead your family. So that's patriarchal. And it means, because we even look, you know, at the Holy Family. So when the Holy Family was in danger from the henchmen of Herod, the angel of God didn't go to the perfect creature, our Blessed Mother. They didn't even go to God Almighty, the high priest, Jesus Christ. They went to St. Joseph and told St. Joseph. He didn't say, we'll talk about it. He just said, take the woman and child and flee. Just take them. And, and he did. And you can imagine waking her up in the middle of the night. Mary, we have to get up and go. Where, Joseph? Egypt. So, yes, Joseph, right? But he had the charism to lead that family. And it's interesting. Had- she, she also uh, saw that charism. Though yes. she had said, though she had had this encounter with the angel of God, she she responded to his charism of leadership. Yes, and as did yes. Jesus, because it says he submitted to them and grew in stature before both God and man, wisdom and stature yes. before both God. Yes, and man. so yes, there is absolutely. that. There is that right there after their after um, after the the angel spoke to Joseph. Then that's all you see is Joseph. The I mean in the dream that Joseph then is being led as the head yes. of that household. Yes. And into a very dangerous place. I mean, the last place, you know, a, a Jew is going to want to go is Egypt, mm-hmm. you know, and, and across Been there, that, done that, that, got the t-shirt, right? Right, exactly, <laughs> exactly right. And, uh, you know, and again, I, I don't know, maybe the end of time we'll know, but uh, from heaven, but you know, I, I don't know if J- Joseph, what he encountered on that way, but I'm sure mm-hmm. he, uh, you know, kicked some uh, tail and, and took some names if he had to. Yeah, right. <laughs> Being very, very uh, protective. Well, so, we're, 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 we're going to take a little break here, Doc. Uh, so, Doc, where can people find you again? What's your website? SoulDeepScience.com. Are you going to be in uh, Montana somewhere around mid-August this year? Yeah. Okay, yeah, we're going to look Love each to other up. Here. We'll be rolling thunder through there. We're talking with Dr. Greg Delsaver. I have a. There's a guy here that's in in Hawaii that's hilarious called the the uh, the Brothers and Friends, and it's De Silva. So I keep get, getting your name mixed up with him. In fact, we might have him on our show. He's a hilarious, just hilarious, uh, hilarious guy. This is Bear Wozniak, and you can find um, Doc Delsaver at souldeepscience.com. And we'll be right back with more of the, grip of the, <laughs> the Bear Wozniak adventure. Aloha and welcome back to the Bear Wozniak Adventure. We're here with Dr. Greg Dilsaver. And by the way, my father's name is Greg too, Doc. So uh, it's good to have you on the show. And we're talking about manly, what it means to be man, what, what is manly virtue. And the name of your, the, the book that we're talking about, re- referring to is, the title of it is? Three Marks of Manhood. The Three Marks of Manhood. Um, and that is Priest, Prophet, and King. The thing is, is this this statement, the word the word marks is very interesting to me. As a surfer, I've got marks on my body from surfing. You know, uh, people have marks on their body from having gone to war. Uh, Paul said he bears the marks of Christ in his body. What do you mean by being marked? That these are the marks of manhood. Yes. Yes. Well, it's um. So let's um. For a man to truly to, to lead his family and, and to be able to truly be open to God's will, he has to be open to humiliation. He has to be open to be overwhelmed. He has to be uh, open to, you know, if you will, you know, as you know, surfing, right, getting getting covered up by the, the that, that big wave. Um by the way, I was at the North Shore when I was in the Marine Corps, and I, I just blessed myself with water there. But uh, anyway, it wasn't it wasn't the waves weren't. <laughs> yeah, so you could get humbled real fast. 
Yeah. Yeah, Surf, it's humbling, sur right? Surfers tend to be humble. Yeah, you have, yeah. And, yeah. you know, and, and, you get, and, and you're there, you're bouncing off that, that, that's, that, that floor, that, that and, and, you know, you just got to relax. So, yes, Lord, and, and allow it to happen to you. And allow yourself to be overwhelmed. You can't fight it. So that's what we, so we're talking about. You need to be open to the fact is you're going against, if you will, insurmountable odds. You feel inadequate. See, mm -hmm. you're going to. If you now, if you're just living a, a, a superficial life, you may feel in control. But if you're actually engaging in the battle between good and evil, if you're actually espousing the cause of faith and family, you're going to feel overwhelmed and you're going to be scared, you know, and, and you're going to feel inadequate. But then you say, Lord, it's OK. I'm going to do this anyway for love of you. Mm -hmm. So that's the mark. Now, it's a mark. It's a mark in the soul, because what happens is. This is exactly how our soul is healed by actually the diminishment of our pride and self-love. So it's going to hurt. It's going to be humiliating. It's going to be painful. But I'm going to say my love of God allows me to decrease so he may increase, allows me to give my life for something that is greater than I am. Yeah, it's beautiful. It's beautiful. Just open, opening your life to... Uh, just being the thing you said about being humble to being humiliated. Um, I know there came a time in my life, you know, as a champion surfer, there's a lot of people that say to say great things about me and a lot of people that hate me. And my son Shane gave me great wisdom once. He said, Dad, they're both wrong. You know, but there's nothing, you know, <laughs> you know, you are who you are before God. And that's what true humility is, is looking at yourself from God's perspective. You are who you are before God, not what men think about you. And in this day and age, the cross current is so strong that for you to say that, that even that God exists or for you to say that there's such a thing as absolute value or for you to say that there's only two genders means you're, you're, you're going against the stream. Um, so what, what, what area, priest, prophet, and king, can you touch on those three, those three marks of, of manhood? Yes. That? We've only got a few minutes left. but Okay. Well, again, as, as that priest, again, it is ultimately the father's responsibility to be the spiritual director of his family. It's nobody else's responsibility. He has the charisma to do that and lead that family. And, you know, you can't really expect a priest or a pastor to do that from the pulpit. Today, every family is on the front lines. It's really guerrilla warfare. So this is the charism. This is the, this is the, the uniqueness of this third millennium as the age of the laity, as the age of the family, as the age of the father and the age of the mother. That's the third millennium. And so it's, it's a great and beautiful thing. And, and so, but we have to stand up then. We have to be willing to say yes to the Lord. And here we are, though. We're weak and foolish as a generation of men, right? And today, yes, the world does condemn patriarchy on all its levels. So today, all we have, the only patriarchy we have is one based solely on the commission of Christ. Not, and it has, that means it's purified of all of that worldly or egoistic elements. So as John Paul II, you know, rightly, you know, has had condemned, but we need to have one based purely on Christ. So that's the priest. He has to have that spiritual vision. And I, and I tell you, the way you get that, number one, you have to be pure. And I'm talking specifically sexual purity. Mm -hmm. You have to be exclusively devoted to your wife. That's where that charism comes from. Otherwise, you're not going to have the vision to lead that family. Praise God. Now, that's going to give you the courage as well, priest, prophet, and king, because prophet means you have to speak truth to power. That's what you were alluding to. We have the power now. It's a demonic power. And I tell you what, you do. You have the state. You have the popular culture. Everything against you as a Christian man. But you cannot fear. You cannot be cowed. You cannot fear humiliation because they will humiliate you. But if you're not afraid of humiliation, you gain the greatest courage possible. So we need to have those kind of men today, men that have the true courage and are willing to be prophetic. Speak prophecy to your kids, speak prophecy to your family, speak prophecy to your culture. That's where we are. And you know what happens to prophets, right? Mm -hmm. <laughs> they get yeah. killed. That's right. So, but be not afraid. Mm -hmm. Love God and know that that's what you can do is you can give your life for this. And then finally, king. What's that mean? No, it doesn't mean, honey, get me a beer, and you know, uh, you know, you know, <laughs> as I watch the football game. It means that the king is noblesse oblige. 
That's the principle of being a king. That means that you are the one that go first. You're the one that die for the family. You are the servant of that family, and you lead the way. And yes, you do. You do take. You take the hits. You, it's, it's, it's your responsibility. You're the one accountable for what goes on in that family. Nobody else. Again, not the priest, not some you know teacher, not some other mentor. It's you as the father that are accountable for those family's souls. You are. And you have to take that hit. And yes, it is very that is very fearful to say, okay, I have to make the decision what to do with my family, you know, as I did. You know, we're moving to Montana, right? So, but I had to trust God, and it was, it was afraid, you know. But again, same thing with St. Joseph. He had to go to Egypt, whatever. We have to have the courage to take responsibility and let, let it stop with us. You know, you, talk, you talked about a, a king is, um, a king lays down his life. You know, he's the one that should lead the charge. Uh, that's what servant leadership is all about, and we need as men to be. We we need as we need uh, a challenge. You think about the, the book of Nehemiah when uh, I love that book when Nehemiah comes to back to Jer- to Jerusalem and he sees the walls have fallen down, and the first several chapters of that book are basically say that this man and his family rebuilt the wall from here to here, and this man and his family rebuilt the wall from here to here. And this man and his family rebuilt the wall from here to here. So it's the domestic church is the key, but it's the man leading his family and then men coming together too. Like there's the walls of Jericho, right, that had to come down. There's these walls that isolate men from each other. We can't acknowledge to each other that we, we can't get humble, as you said, to be humiliated enough to go to a priest, to go to a friend and say, I'm having a challenge with pornography. We're not able to, go, we, we, we don't go to a men's group because we don't want to open up and be honest with each other. Those kind of walls need to come down. The walls of Jericho need to come down, but the walls of Nehemiah, then we can build, rebuild the walls by leading our church. And remember, when, the, when, they rebuilt that, when they rebuilt that wall, as they began to be successful, they came under even more attack. So one man would stand with his shield and his spear protecting the other man as he built. And those who were um, carrying the mortar and stuff, they would carry their sword outside of their sheath while carrying the supplies uh, to the men that are rebuilding. We need to stand side by side with other men. How do men come in relationship with other men? I, we got a minute, so. Uh, yes. Oh, praise God. That's beautiful. That's beautiful. I'm going to have to read that passage, Bear. Thank you. And yes, you know what? And I said it's guerrilla warfare. So that's like the you know, fourth generation warfare. But guess what? If every man is truly open to God's inspiration and has a vision from Christ, it will all, in God's economy of grace, come together and coalesce. And yeah. we'll all work together in in a way that cannot be stomped out, cannot be stopped. But the guerrilla warfare is the more, most effective. We're waiting all of it to come from the top down. It's never going to happen. We have to take take it in, take it into our own hands. Uh, well, under that authority. But hearing, if we're not a priest first, ministering to the Lord, spending an hour every day with the Lord, we're going to not know how, where to lead, or we're not going to have a prophetic voice. We're talking with Dr. Greg Dilsaver. We're going to have him back. Doc, we need to have you back a lot more. Really respected what you had to say. And where's the, where's your website again? SoulDeepScience.com. SoulDeepScience. SoulDeepScience.com. This is the Bear Wozniak Adventure. I have to tell you to go to our website. This is what my producer tells me to tell you. Go to our website, especially you men, if you want to become a part of Bear's Man Cave. It's a private uh, Facebook group. We get up, we get together every two or three weeks on a Zoom video chat. And the men challenge and equip each other, mobilize each other to move on the Lord. So go to our, our website, deepadventure.com, and you can join Bear's Man Cave there. Uh, we're looking forward to uh, seeing you guys next week. And you can go to our YouTube channel, Bear Wozniak, and subscribe to the video version of this, the radio show. Until next week, may the breath of the Holy Spirit aloha you. Aloha. You've been listening to the Bear Wozniak Adventure. Go to bearwozniak.com to get your free audio and other exciting content. Plus, you can pick up the Long Ride Home 10-episode DVD set, autographed copies of Bear's books, Long Ride Home shirts, tanks, coffee cups, and even motorcycle pins and patches. And find out how guys can sign up for Bear's Man Cave online Facebook group, all at bearwozniak.com. 